nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Good morning, everybody. I'm glad to see so many familiar faces here, and it's a particular privilege for me to welcome you all to the first in this newly endowed Landstrom Data Seminar Series. Now, I'm neither Landstrom nor Data, as probably most of you know. My name is Jörg Appenzeller. I'm a colleague of Mark Landstrom and Suprio, and I learned to appreciate their brilliant minds over many years. In fact, the reason that I ended up at Purdue is because of them to a large extent. Uh, I learned during my PhD time everything about mesoscopic physics. For those of you that don't know what that term means, that's fine. There's a great book you should read from Suprio and, of course, from Mark about uh, transport in semiconductors. And I believe that um, uh, a colleague of ours, um, Mark Ratner, must also have felt very impressed about the two of them because what he did, and he's a theoretical chemist that had worked with them together for many, many years, in fact was on one of the original proposals to NSF that led to the Network of Computational Nanotechnology, NCN. He has then taken a very interesting step when he uh, retired, namely he came up with this endowment for this seminar series and we are very happy that he did so and I'm particularly pleased that he named them after my famous colleagues Landrum and Data. Thank you very much and please kick off this meeting. All right. There he is. Uh, I'm Lundstrom. So uh, it, it was a real pleasure, thank you, Jorg, it was a real pleasure working with Mark Ratner for almost 20 years, Suprio worked with him for even longer. Uh, that was reward enough, but then uh, to endow this lecture series, that was completely unexpected and is very special and we're deeply appreciative. What Suprio and I hope to do is to use this series to bring some very special people to campus and talk about some things that we don't talk about often enough. So we hope that this lecture will be the first in a, in a series of many. We're discussing teaching and research. This is central to what we do at a research university. Uh, we had help from a lot of organizations on campus to organize and to promote this event, beginning with the Office of the Provost and the Teaching Academy, uh, the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering, the College of Engineering, the College of Science, the College of Liberal Arts, the Graduate School, the Office of Vice President for Research and Partnerships, Sigma Chi, and Discovery Park. So we're grateful for all of those organizations for helping us put this event on. Uh, now, just a quick comment about the format. We'll begin with a talk by Professor Hoffman. Uh, after his talk, he'll be joined on stage uh, with Provost Jay Ackridge to have a discussion about the issues raised during the talk. And we hope that there will be a few questions from you all during that time period as well. So please turn off your cell phones, uh, no pictures during the event itself. Uh, and with that, I would like to bring out my colleague, Ciprio Data, to introduce our speaker. Let me start by thanking Dr. Roald Hoffman for kindly agreeing to give this inaugural lecture. It is indeed a great pleasure and privilege to welcome him to Purdue. Now, Dr. Hoffman has very broad interests. He's a chemist, he's a playwright, he's a poet, and just last night I found out that he knew a lot more about modern Bengali poetry than I did. And in case you're wondering, Bengali is my mother tongue. <laughs> so that tells you something about the breadth of his interests. Anyway, but today he'll talk about something that we all know something about. And in fact, many of us probably have opinions on it, have thought about it. And that's this connection between research and teaching. And usually the common wisdom is we realize these are these two branches of our mission. And what we argue about is whether one, whether they're co-equal or one of them is more important than the other. But Dr. Hoffman has a very different view. He, to him, there is only one branch, and it involves both teaching and research. And this is not just an abstract view. His own work exemplifies it. So for example, one of his signature research contributions 
is this Woodward Hoffman rules. And these are featured in undergraduate chemistry textbooks. See, so last night I took out my copy of Morrison and Boyd. Actually, my <laughs> wife's copy. She's a chemist. But, and this is a classic organic chemistry text. You see this is now in its sixth edition, I believe. What I have, or what we have, is from the 1970s. It was like the second edition or the third edition. Now, this is what it had to say about the Woodward Hoffman rules. So let me read so I don't do it right here. Yeah. So it, get it right. Very often in organic chemistry, many facts are accumulated, and then a theory is proposed to account for them. But in this case, just the reverse has been true. Facts were sparse, and Woodward and Hoffman made predictions, which have since been borne out by experiments. And all this is even more convincing because the events predicted seemed unlikely on any ground other than the theory being tested. The theory lay in the mathematics, and what was needed was the spark of genius to see the application to chemical reactions. So that was nearly five decades ago, but I believe it set the tone of his lifelong work. You know, this combination of profound understanding and elegant simplicity. And this is what defines, I believe, his views of teaching and research, which he'll share with us today. So without further ado, let us welcome our distinguished speaker, Professor Roald Hoffman. Thank you, thank you. So, I'm very glad to be speaking in a series endowed by, by Mark Ratner, who is a remarkable theoretical chemist and whose life has intersected in productive ways with, uh, with both Suprio and with me. Uh, and I'm, I'm especially happy to, uh, to be invited to a series which has, uh, which honors Supriyo Data. Uh, and I couldn't find a better picture, a picture than this because he's teaching. And that's, that's uh, it's not the only thing he's good at. I also don't want to separate it from the research, as you heard, but you can see the joy in the teaching. And it's not just for the photograph there. It's really there. And uh, after listening to him for 17 hours, it's still there. Um, and in his face and in ours, too. So. Uh, I want to tell you about some ideas uh, about, about teaching and research. Here is what's out there. Um, and that is that these are separate, uh, even disparate activities uh, that in research university, realistically, despite lip service being paid to teaching, that uh, research dominates in evaluations of faculty, for instance. Um, the third thing is that teaching, in some way, uh, people would might say encroaches on uh, their uh, time that they have for doing research. And uh, fourth, uh, something out there is that in terms of justifying why one would need for teachers to do research is to uh, that research builds expertise, authority, and authenticity in um, the uh, teaching. Uh, I'm going to argue that research and teaching are inseparable. Um, that's going to be simple. What's going to be less simple is that the desire and the obligation 
to teach, uh, if one wants to separate them in that way, that they make you a better researcher. And I will try to show this in my own work, um, at least in some way. Now, on the separation of teaching and research, I think the problem is uh, that it's better to talk about this in terms not of place where it happens, in a classroom, in your office, in, in, a, in reading a scientific paper, listening to a talk, but I think it's better to talk about this in terms of audiences for, uh, for the teaching or learning to take place. Um, the, the, aud the audiences, I will argue, are overlapping and enlarging and overlapping as we go from, from the beginning of an idea which might have a chance of being an original idea. In the beginning, uh, there, is, uh, there is a gleam in somebody's eye, I mean in the mind. There is an idea, um, a, a gleam of the truth or a connection within an individual's mind. Uh, actually, I've experienced most such moments not uh, in isolation by myself, but in discourse, uh, in talking to another person, or when I sit down to write uh, a paper and before me is a draft or a progress report. Uh, let me tell you what happens from a, from a poem, uh, perhaps, which I put up here. Uh, because what I, I want to tell you, I want to give you an idea of what's in my mind at the time when I get the idea. Um, and what's in there is, to summarize it briefly, a holy mess. Okay? <laughs> Deep in, it's a docile crowd waiting for the train of concentration to haul the first words onto paper. It listens, then stirs the one that speaks in many voices to say, these are just words falling limp into untense space they need sculpt, or make me understand they hate my compromises. Here and there they offer up a phrase. In their babble I hear the voices of my teachers rise from a page or cafe. Sometimes one speaks with an accent. I think it's my father, it's him, the world I have to please. For them I leave no word unturned. For it I sing, tone deaf that I am, the song that frees itself within. Um, we go on. There is a discussion with another paper. Uh, and uh, with another person ensues, then with a group, with my research group, something very interesting happens in the process of discussion. Uh, to paraphrase uh, Derrida, uh, writing or speaking is the message that abandons. That is, you say it, in, in my mind is a mess, as I've told you, not in your mind, but in my mind. And then I say something, it's an idea. And the moment I say it or write it down, something else enters. I have to justify. The context of justification comes in. I have to justify what I said. And so like a good boy, I come up with arguments to defend my position in a group meeting. In, in the process of writing something down, I go through alternatives, but I come up with justification. And that voicing or writing is a very important part of the reality. The other part which Derrida addresses is the moment you voice it, you've lost it. It's no longer your own. It doesn't matter why you said it in some way. It matters what you said. And everyone is free to interpret those signs in a different, in a different way. 
Uh, an invited technical seminar introduces another audience. Sure, I want to impress my colleagues. Uh, I want to claim precedence, power. I want to please real or surrogate parents. Many things go on subliminally in the presentations of any talk. But most of all, I want to impart some, some new knowledge, something I'm convinced is true. Um, and the problem is that the people in the audience, quite aside from the fact that some may be sleepy, uh, they do not understand what I need to say. And I'm talking at the same time to people who understand everything and to people who understand a little and to people who understand nothing. And the magic of the teaching process is that you can do this with the same words. And it's very interesting to, to think how it is that we accomplish that. And then I write a paper. And in writing that paper, I imagine an audience, of course. I actually know who I'm writing for, which is the intelligent graduate student and not the professor. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, <laughs> Uh, the reason I know that, it, it's so obvious. Those intelligent graduate students are the only people who will read my paper carefully. <laughs> the reason is that some professor somewhere has assigned them for a group meeting to summarize the papers in this journal that has just come out, and they are my most careful reader. Besides, the professor's minds cannot be changed. Uh, but the graduate students can. You can influence people. So I write for them, of course. That gets me into trouble with the gatekeepers. I'll come back to that. Uh, but I write these uh, things, and I write a research paper, and I have an audience in mind, and I write for that audience. I have learned certain ways tactics, strategies to catch that audience. And you know, I have learned them from teaching freshman chemistry. Because it's the same audience in terms of the mixture of knowledge and ignorance that is in that audience. And there is no way for me, with those potential 100 graduate students around the world who are the intelligent readers of my paper. There is no way for me to grab them around by the scruff of their neck and tell them this is what I meant and not that. It all has to be in those words that I, that I have. And it's not that different from teaching introductory chemistry. So um, I, uh, I, 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 I am I see this in terms of different audiences. And that audience of those graduate students is not that different from the first year, from that first year audience. Uh, now, the second proposition that, so I, this is what I've just said, that research and teaching are inseparable in that dance. The second proposition that teachers that I want to advance, I'll do it in two parts, that teaching makes um, a better researcher, that is arguably more controversial. Uh, but I can tell you about myself. And I am certain for myself that I have become a better researcher, a better theoretical chemist, because I had to teach undergraduates and in particular because I had to teach first year chemistry at Cornell. I didn't want to teach first year chemistry when I came. I came at a time when the chairman could just tell you, this is what you have to teach of the department. That doesn't happen any longer, but I did. When I began, for instance, just to be specific, when I began at Cornell, uh, I knew all about thermodynamics. I knew all about those beautiful partial differential relationships, equations that relate the derivative of A with respect, the partial derivative of A with respect to B, 
to something else, like uh, the derivative of the energy with respect to the volume to the pressure. I got, had gotten an A plus in a thermodynamic course uh, in, at Harvard before. And then I was put to teaching freshman chemistry, and I couldn't use partial derivatives. <laughs> and I had not learned at Harvard that thermodynamics is a um, subject of great historical significance, that it had to do with its beginnings, with careful definitions of work and heat coming from the inability of uh, constructors of steam engines in uh, England in the Industrial Revolution to exceed a certain efficiency in the construction of those steam engines. It came from the heat generated in the boring of cannon. Uh, and that eventually in time, a mathematical structure of breathtaking uh, generality and sophistication got attached to it, but that one had these empirical beginnings. I had followed only the mathematics until I had to explain to first year students the subject without the crutch of the mathematical apparatus that was available. That's when I learned thermodynamics. Um, and the more I did this, of course there was a joy in explaining, a joy in turning on knowledge in people. And I wanted, uh, as a good boy, to, to please uh, whoever it was that I was pleasing. And so I learned how to do this. And it became important to me to explain at every level, but especially I grew with time to appreciate uh, how significant that explanation at, in some way at the lowest level, if one can call it. And what I would say is that the uh, rhetoric of pedagogy permeated my research. Now, I want to explain this because it sounds like a fancy sentence. I don't, I don't mean anything fancy by this, but it gives me an excuse because I like to show real examples to show you a chemical example. So here for my chemistry friends is a structure um, and it's an actual example of something I did. So what I want to show you is what do I mean by the rhetoric of pedagogy in the context of, a, of a, an example. I have written 650 papers like this and not everyone is a good exercise in pedagogy, but uh, some are. Here was something we saw in uh, Angevante Chemie. It was a structure of a molecule with the formula cesium-3 tellurium-22. It's not an individual molecule. It's an extended structure. And what you see here is a unit cell, which is to be repeated easily, in this case, in three dimensions and looks complicated. The white balls are telluriums, the black balls are cesiums in this structure. And we eventually uh, wrote a paper about this. Our paper a year later is at the bottom. The paper that stimulated it is at the top. Now, there are other compounds of cesium and tellurium. For instance, at the top, uh, none of them are useful. Okay, this is fun. Uh, and you can see uh, after I show, tell you about the structure, why this is fun. There are other formulas that are around. So that, that there is more than one thing of something, that's fun. Okay, that, that people, the periodic table is fun, that there are similarities, the periodic table is fun because there are differences in it. And that there are 15 compounds of cesium and tellurium that you and I didn't know about is absolutely the greatest fun. Um, and this one has cesium-3, tellurium-22, and has certain units in it. Perhaps you see uh, there are, are rings which are crown-shaped, which have eight telluriums in them. That's actually the favored structure 
Some of you may, I, I think I have a periodic table here. There it is. If you look, tellurium is under sulfur. That's all I wanted to tell you about. Because <laughs> I knew that this auditorium was not a good chemistry auditorium, so it didn't have a periodic table in it. Um, the, um, there are these rings of tellurium which are like the elemental form of sulfur, but no one had seen those rings for tellurium. So it's interesting that in order to find a structure for tellurium that it should have because it was under sulfur in a periodic table that, and that still had never been found, in order to find it one had to find a compound of tellurium. So those little crown shaped things are, are t neutral tellurium 8, there are cesium pluses and they are together with the other network which is a little hard to see in this and which is planar and you see at the top and the bottom and the middle of the unicell and I'll show you what that looks like. It looks like that if you looked at that planar framework and now you look at this and this is one of the interesting things about symmetry it is that I don't have to tell you that this is beautiful. It has a beeline into our soul. Therefore, the lesson for science really is, is how to, uh, how to uh, in your mind, find a way to, to find things that are not symmetrical as beautiful. Because the beautiful ones have too easy a way in. Um, this is an interesting network. It's one of a number of such networks. Um, so uh, these are these are the 17 planar or freeze uh, or uh, wallpaper groups. The 17 ways that one has of having symmetry in two dimensions. There are seven ways in one dimension, and there are 230 ways in three dimensions. These are the 17 ways. When it comes to Christmas, we see them all in the wrapping. You don't have to go to the Alhambra, uh, but you can see them also in Granada in Spain. Uh, these are, uh, this is one of these particular groups uh, that's in this network. It's a very interesting one because it has fourfold axes, which are very obvious. What are less obvious are some twofold axes of symmetry and others. Anyway, what it also has is obviously Black is tellurium, and the white here is the cesium. I've switched the colors. That the telluriums come T-shaped and also linear, as you can see in these. So I got interested in these, and uh, I wanted to analyze these. Now, here is what I would do. Here is what you can see in most of the papers written on this, and does not um, show a uh, pedagogical interest or incentive. What you do is you take this structure that I just showed you and what you do is you do a calculation of the band structure, the electronic structure of the material with some quantum mechanical software that you can buy for a thousand dollars. You get a band structure, a density of states, you test whether the structure is dynamically stable, you calculate the phonons in the structure, and then perhaps you calculate whether it is a superconductor, and especially if your calculation, which I wouldn't trust a bit, um, is, uh, gives you a, a TC of 200 degrees, you try to publish it in science. That is routine work in the trade on these materials. There are thousands of papers published like this, and I could train a sixth grader to do that. Um, that does not show any understanding. So where does the understanding uh, derive for me? It derives, it, I can see it in my paper. This is what you'd, you'd calculate. This is, this is meat and potatoes, um, sorry. Or vegan 
Uh, <laughs> I just noticed Burger, Burger King went over to having, for a dollar extra, a vegetarian substitute for, <laughs> in a big whopper. Um, here is a picture of our paper, and you cannot see a thing, and nor do I mean for you to be able to read a thing. The point is that in this paper, what we start out with is we take this apart. Uh, I, I can calculate where the electrons are in this. That's interesting, but it's not the most interesting thing. I'm, I'm interested why this hangs together. Why are some of the telluriums linear? And why are some of them T-shaped and three-coordinate? So what I do and what's being done at lower left in that little figure is I take a tellurium dihydride with a varying charge on it. That's a model. There's no hydrogen in the structure. But I take that as a model for what I want to do. And uh, I take it and I bend it as a function of the number of electrons on the molecule. And that's what that little drawing is there. Then I describe the bonding, and it's interesting how I talk about it in the bonding in this molecule. Again, you don't need to understand the words at all, but what, uh, the way I talk about it is a connection needs to be made here to the classical and well-characterized linear triiodide. Uh, which is isoelectronic tellurium 3, 4 minus, as is the related xenon F2. Why? What am I doing here? Uh, I'm in that little corner of the periodic table where you see tellurium next to iodine next to xenon. Not a place you usually look in a periodic table for interesting chemistry, but that's where this stuff is going on. And it matters that they have the same number of electrons. And then I I draw something about the orbitals of it, and the bonding in these is very well understood. We have in these molecules an electron rich three center bond, and then I draw it. Uh, draw it. That drawing has appeared in the literature at least 1,700 times, and yet I draw, I, I draw it again in this paper. Why am I doing this? The reason I'm doing this is because I'm trying to understand it. And one of the things I've learned in introductory chemistry is it doesn't hurt to repeat something if you try to get people to understand something. So I am using part of that strategy. Uh, here is, uh, people recognize this. Here is. We made the mistake of submitting four papers at the same time to a good journal, Journal of Chemical Physics. Ernie Davidson, who's a friend who's been an editor for at various journals where papers I've written over 30 years, uh, writes, as you can read, we've had this discussion many times over the years that I've been an editor. The referees consistently urge you to write papers in a terse style designed for other experts, and you persist in writing papers intelligible to students and postdocs. He's got it right. <laughs> it's exactly what I'm doing. Um, certainly, the stated journal policies favor the referees in this. Well, what you can see is I run into trouble with the gatekeepers. Um, it's not the only strategy I use, the teaching strategy, the pedagogic strategy, but I wanted to show you a little bit, sort of the, get the general flavor of what I mean by that. Uh, we go on in this paper, we go on, and, and c c should we count it as teaching strategy or not, that I try to understand the particular network that is there in silesium, in, in cesium-3, tellurium-22, in the context of another network, which you see at upper left, where I filled in with white spots the squares to make a, a perfect square network whose orbitals I know very well. Um, there must be a relationship between the, what's observed in the cesium and the perfect square, if you like, archetype of it. Uh, I ask the questions that I want to ask that are obvious questions. 
why does it go into that T-shape? Why doesn't it give the, most, the more symmetrical network? And are there other ways of partitioning those tellurium atoms in two-dimensional space, which you see at lower left, um, at lower part of this diagram, which could be an alternative? Uh, and we go on to suggest some molecules, and one of them actually has been made. Um, it's not easy to make predictions. It's not easy to make risky predictions. We were very lucky, um, but I've learned how to do this. All right, I have to hold myself from going on about this molecule, but I, 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 it was an interesting molecule. I do want to talk about another approach to the second proposition that I uh, made, and that is that, uh, that uh, getting explanation, that teaching is, is a way to gain understanding and therefore is of value in research. I want to take off from a paper I'm writing right now, which is not so much a scientific paper, but more a philosophical, polemical one. And if I give you the title of the paper, I'm doing this together with a great French theoretical chemist, Jean-Paul Malrieux. And uh, its title is Simulation versus Understanding, Attention in quantum chemistry and beyond. So uh, what this article is about, it goes on for 110 pages, um, is about the wave that is descending on us in theoretical chemistry, but not only in theoretical chemistry, in every field of science and technology and in society in general. And this is the way, great wave of artificial intelligence, and uh, whose arms you can label machine learning, artificial neural networks, whatever you want. Uh, and this uh, wave is changing our world. Um, and um, what we want to do is to fight with it. Uh, we want eventually to come to an accommodation with it, which we will. But uh, we, uh, we definitely want to define the difference between, um, let's say, uh, uh, the, what we mean by understanding and explanation. I'll get to teaching in a moment. Uh, understanding, explanation, knowledge, and what artificial intelligence, while promising us better numbers, does not give us. Um, and that is, so we have to first understand what it is that we have learned uh, and which understanding knowledge theory. Uh, so what is understanding? It, these are, these are uh, words with philosophical import, they have been worried about from the time of the Greek philosophers, and we don't add uh, that much to it. The words are subtle, the words are different in different languages. Uh, for those of you who might know German or Spanish, will, for instance, uh, in English, we don't have that distinction, except in Scots, we have wit and ken. Um, but uh, in German, wissen und kenntnis and entender and comprender, in Spanish, a slight, somewhat different meanings of, of understand. One logical, one more intuitive. Um, understanding is uh, generally at or often a tacit state of mind. Um, it is usually qualitative, but it has quantitative aspects. Let me not be so vague about it. The rainbow has been with us for a while. Um, understanding the rainbow 
means many things. And into that understanding goes the, into its eventually obtaining its understanding, as Newton did, goes and with predecessors, with forerunners, there goes in the, the qualitative aspects of water droplets. <laughs> didn't take Newton, didn't take the Greek philosophers to observe that rainbows always occur on the opposite side to the source of illumination, the sun, um, and that you need water droplets in order to have rainbows, though you could have droplets of other things as well. But that it, uh, qualitative things about it are interesting, so is the fact that the rainbow doesn't go up 70 degrees. It goes up 42 degrees uh, from the horizon. And that explanation, the qualitative aspects of that explanation, which is as striking a demonstration of understanding optics as it was in Newton's time, the qualitative aspects are water droplets, uh, the ideas of refraction, uh, reflection um, that are in this. Uh, the, uh, the refractive index of water is important in it, and you can come up with 42 degrees. It was very impressive in Newton's time, and it is still impressive to a student today. So the qualitative and the quantitative reinforce each other. Uh, you, um, the, uh, the understanding, even though it's very quiet, it happens in your mind. It has this feeling, if not eureka, it has a feeling of joy when you understand something. Um, and so let me give you an example. There is a I, a quotation here from Andrew Wiles of what happened during the complicated proof of Fermat's last theorem when he, uh, when he did it. This is reported by Singh in a book from an interview. And he tells the story, and it's a story of many of, there was a proof and there was a mistake in the proof, and the mistake had to be fixed. The proof was not easy. Um, and here he describes, and you can read it as well as myself, that moment of joy that came in the understanding. It's almost mystical. What you see at bottom, I'll give you just a second to read the quote by Andrew Wiles. What you see at bottom is uh, Blaise Pascal, the French writer, philosopher, sewed into the lining of his coat, and it was found when he, was, when he died. Uh, this phrase here about the understanding, in his case, uh, strongly religiously motivated. Um, understanding is universally satisfying. And in that is danger. The danger is that uh, it may be wrong witness the disbelief in evolution or climate change for too many Americans who think they have understanding, uh, but it's not quite the correct. Explanation is very close to understanding, um, and, but it's inherently more pedagogic, it's also rhetorical, storytelling, and performative. And I wish I had the time to tell you about all of these things, uh, about uh, these things. But I can only speak about the special tie between understanding and teaching. And teaching plays uh, a critical role in the formation of understanding. People have tried to move, yes, beyond the master, apprentice, or teacher-student paradigm for transmitting knowledge and mastery. 
but non-biological transmission of our culture defines the human condition and it seems to us that some variant of this older younger generation will interact whereas understanding is usually quiet tacit contemplative to attain it it clearly helps to exercise that facility Socratic dialogue, meaning talking to one person, questioning, uh, serves, but closer to home is what many of us are paid for, which is to teach. Uh, teaching forces you to explain, thereby voicing what may be tentative and sometimes muddled in my brain. In the process, you also get instant feedback the students understand or fall asleep uh, and you understand the importance is just as much in the teaching process to the gaining of understanding to the teacher as well as the student teaching also leads you to construct simple narratives stories one can see, one can say this less positively, one can say that both teacher and student have entered into a nonverbal contract to make the world simple, too simple. We all love to teach explanations. Um, and what if the world is complicated? But there is a positive side to this process. A story is woven, and I'm, I'm very positive about storytelling and narrative. I think they are, like metaphor, substantially underrated as the motive forms of science. Um, not only are stories understood, but students are also likely to apply the models or explanations couched in stories to in ways you would not have thought of so that the power and generality of understanding are immediately tested all i'm saying is to the teaching forces you to get outside your mind and to tell a, to tell the explanation as a story and let's see if it flies you will learn very quickly that's what teaching gives you Teaching and learning are near mirrors, but they are distinct. There is much more one can say l about learning. It's hardly a passive action in which one's head is filled with facts. Uh, Thomas Aquinas was closer to what happens in learning. It, the latent powers of reasoning always there are awakened in a student. You teach them only to think. And lucky is the awakener as well. Understanding a phenomenon or a theory enables one to verbally formulate an explanation, to retrace the deductive trail followed in the demonstration. In other words, to teach what one has understood. Why has one has understood why things are. The caveat, as I've mentioned, is that that understanding is provisional, always, and just might be wrong. Uh, in general, I see understanding as the more toward the passive end of the spectrum, explanation more of the active one. It's interesting, if, 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 one, uh, if understanding tends to be pa passive, it is still best formed um, in an active, very social mode by listening, talking, and teaching. And both our understanding and explanation are certainly welcomed by the eye, uh, by, the, by the human being. They are a source of joy, that's what those demonstrations are. It's time here to assert uh, my confidence in what we do in conclusion. We teach, we awaken in young minds the ability to deal with the balance of simplicity and complexity that characterizes 
chemistry or electrical engineering or an affirmative action law. We believe, and I feel confident that it's not only uh, I who thinks this way, that science and technology instruction at every level must be done in the context of a liberal arts education, fighting compartmentalization all the way and connecting our science to economics, literature, history, society, to culture, to culture in the broadest sense. I believe the student is best served by being led to value that true understanding. It seems an imperfect system, what we're in, this concentration of research, scholarly actions, teaching functions at one place, a research university. It's also an idea, the research university, the reality of it, uh, that it generates stress for the individuals who make it go with minimal financial encouragement to what else they could find in society. But what a place. The exciting, tense, productive research setting is where is the one in which professors do their balancing act, the university. The students correctly see this as what it is, which is really the world of the hands and mind, really learning, teaching, trying to, to understand both of those. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Thank you. Well, thanks again for being with us uh, today, Professor Hoffman. And I'm sure that the lecture stimulated a, a lot of questions on, uh, on your part. Uh, we, were, we were talking earlier, this, uh, this presentation, uh, this discussion is particularly important because we are in the process as a campus of talking about the future of our teaching and learning enterprise. And one of the first uh, themes that's emerged as part of our roadmap is the idea of how do we uh, elevate, promote, support uh, great teaching in a Research One uh, land-grant institution. So, uh, so again, I think it's particularly relevant. I, I've got a few questions to, to start, and, uh, but we're going to allow uh, certainly uh, to, to see what questions you have on your mind. We have microphones on the side. I'd like to get a couple on the table, and then, uh, then we'll see what you would like to, uh, to explore with, uh, with Professor Hoffman. The, um, maybe I'll pick up on the, the last point you were making about the liberal arts, and, and certainly here. Uh, we, we talk a lot about the importance of liberal arts education and uh, uh, as part of a STEM education. And, and uh, as Supero indicated, uh, you've had a, an incredible career as a chemist, a poet, a, a playwright. And, and how have these uh, broader activities uh, really influenced your career as a, as a scientist? So, uh, first of all, it all goes back to college, uh, all these interests. And I have some of my books lying here, uh, which you can look at afterwards. Um, it all goes back, in my case, to Columbia College, Columbia University, and a core curriculum where there, everyone took certain courses in social science and in, the, in literature. And there were also courses in um, history of art and, his, and music uh, that we took. Uh, that liberal art education was the beginning of all my interests. In fact, uh, it's a miracle that I, I became a chemist almost by accident. I started out as a, a pre-med in this setting. Um, it, um, I really didn't want to go to medical school. I don't know why, uh, but uh, it took me, uh, it, I, but I was taking these chemistry courses. It took me about a year uh, to work up the courage to tell my parents. I was the only child of Jewish American uh, immigrants. There was not a lot of pressure to become a doctor. Uh, the, um, 
nothing special about Jewish Americans. I spend a lot of my time uh, telling Asian Americans right now how to tell their parents they don't want to be doctors. <laughs> uh, the, um, it's, but uh, it took me some courage to work up to say to them, I didn't want to be a doctor, but I, one summary of my uh, college education is I didn't have enough courage to tell them I wanted to be an art historian. That would have killed them. Uh, so, the, um, but uh, meanwhile, the science courses were not interesting. The only thing that kept me going was summer research experiences, and eventually, eventually, halfway through my PhD in chemistry, I did make a commitment to chemistry. Um, that was. Uh, the education, the general education is very important. And I feel particularly badly for your engineering students. So let, let me voice my, not based on your students, but on our students at Cornell. I feel they're the most oppressed part of, academically, of our student body. Because my colleagues here have kept the quality of the engineering education as high as it is with all the science that they need. But in the last 40 years, they just managed to squeeze in, in addition, a computer science education. Those poor kids, uh, they don't have any time, especially to, uh, and what, and when I tell them that you should that a young uh, engineering student could wait another year to make $100,000. Uh, they tell me, no, we can't compete with Purdue, or something like that. So they stay with four years. Uh, an en undergraduate engineering education should definitely go to five years, and there should be an enlargement of the uh, humanities and social sciences component of that. So all these things are very important, I feel the general education. I know it doesn't feel that way for our students, but especially it's important in this time when, uh, when there is all the natural pressure to gain a technologically uh, valid education. We'll have to share later uh, an initiative, yeah. uh, the, uh, the Cornerstone Initiative, Integrated Liberal Arts uh, here that's uh, intended to help uh, are those in the STEM disciplines have a broader and, and deeper appreciation for liberal arts in the context of their technical disciplines. So that's something we can talk about uh, right. later. Obviously, in your talk, you make a very compelling case that research makes, uh, or teaching makes us better scholars, but you also make the case that, you know, it's, it's some, certainly something that's uncommon. And, you know, as, as we think about this, you know, what can we do to encourage our, our best uh, researchers, research-intensive faculty to be uh, to teach and to teach well at the undergraduate uh, level? I think the, um, we should not make a distinction between research-oriented faculty and, um, and others. I think uh, departments should set an example by having their top researchers uh, certain to teach undergraduate courses at every level. Um, I think we need to get everyone involved in, in the teaching, but also to make room for all these courses that I, I think the students should take. I don't have any, uh, it has to come from within, from, from within the society of within this, this scientist society uh, and how to value. My colleagues are crying about money all the time. But uh, let me give you some facts about Cornell uh, just to show you. And especially they're crying if, God forbid, we should give every humanities professor a free computer or something <laughs> like that. Uh, at Cornell, uh, the total amount of money coming in from government, mainly federal, but state funds is of the order of $450 million last year in science and technology that does count the medical school, which is responsible for a large part of it. 
the total amount of money in the social sciences is about 15 million, and the humanities about uh, about uh, one million. Do you should our children be taught in that proportion? Uh, the scientists are filthy rich. Uh, they are crying, as I said, all the time. Uh, but the amount of money that one is used to in the sciences is, exceeds that in, in the humanities. Uh, so we have to help those parts of the university and support them. So again, I've got some other questions, but if any of you would like to find a microphone, please, uh, please do. So um, undergraduate research is something we're certainly uh, promoting here. Yes. And, 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 and again, I understand the notion of not uh, designating faculty as a particular focus, but, but it is a way for research intensive faculty to engage our, our undergraduates. And, uh, and I, I guess I'd like to hear your thoughts on undergraduate research and uh, yes. how to help faculty connect. So it's a way for undergraduates realize that uh, starting some research is a way to get out of the situation of courses with 100 or 200 people. Um, conversely, young assistant professors should, who are starting should, if they had any sense, would volunteer to teach the introductory chemistry course because what they would then do, as I did in the beginning, is uh, they teach this course with 100 to 200 people. They pick the two top students in the course and offer them a summer job, and they've got an, uh, an associate for three or four years. Works in both directions very well. Uh, so that you can get, uh, I published more with undergraduates than I did with graduate students at the beginning of my career. And that's, so it's very important for undergraduates to get out and into research in a group. The family structure of a research group is something special, scientific research group. Uh, it's one of the strong points of American education. Um, and the quicker you can get into that, the better it is. Carl Brandt, uh, Professor Emeritus of Biochemistry, who also spent 18 years on the dark side in administration. <laughs> Uh, where we interviewed all prospective faculty candidates uh, in the dean's office. Uh, question, you, you raise a very interesting point, but you need to look for faculty candidates that have it within them already, this idea of, of, of how they are going to play an important role in students. Do you have a strategy, questions that, uh, that you have found useful in trying to, to deduce whether that lies within a prospective faculty member? Um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, sometimes they don't know that they are good teachers or they could be good teachers or that they are interested in. So they have to be given a chance. Um, I try to, uh, to ask uh, prospect, I would try to ask them to tell us about a good teaching experience they've had. Ask them to think about something. And then I, I would like to see them analyze it. What is it that made that particular course different from other courses? So that could, that could help a little. Hi, I'm Milan Kulkarni, Electrical and Computer Engineering. Um, you know, I, you made a, a phenomenal case for how our teaching mission helps us with our research mission and is sort of inextricable from our research mission and makes us better uh, researchers, which I think for a bunch of faculty who have been socialized to think of the research mission first and foremost is an incredibly important message. Um, but I often find myself to people outside the university defending the opposite proposition, which is that it's important that we hire good researchers in order to help what these outsiders think of as the primary mission of Purdue, which is teaching. And I was wondering if you had any sort of comments or thoughts on that. Yes, you have, um, you have that special, uh, you have that special responsibility to the state of Indiana to teach well and to teach important things. Uh, sometimes what we teach is not just uh, particular skills, but also the ability to think and to make judgments. And sometimes 
Sometimes I think people don't want our students to think <laughs> uh, in current politics. Um, they want them to act. Uh, I both of these questions are to me very interesting because they address how how one might uh, evaluate the teaching potential in in a prospective job candidate. I, I had not thought too much about it. I will mention that um, Purdue in chemistry is one, and perhaps in other fields, is one of the very few departments in the country uh, in which within a chemistry department there is a place for chemical education. So there are people whose career is uh, chemical education, and that is very rare. And uh, I have tried it to convince my colleagues to do it. No, no go. They don't want it. So at least that is in 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 the right direction. Um, there are ways to help faculty to teach better. I'm sure you have them, centers for teaching excellence, things that provide uh, techniques and clues. We are also in a state, in, at least in chemistry education, where many places are flipping the classroom or some equivalent of that, changing to a more discussion, action-oriented. And that's, that's very, a very interesting time uh, from that point of view. So um, maybe uh, taking on that changing formats uh, point, obviously online education is, uh, is very uh, front and center now in, uh, you know, in, in, in our world. If I'm not mistaken, the 17 hours you spent with Suprio was an online course. Yes. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and that he taught. And, and uh, I'm just curious, I mean, wh what are your thoughts on online education and, and uh, where does that fit into uh, this marriage of, of, uh, of research and, and teaching. For that, it was, for that purpose, it was a wonderful education, uh, what he taught me and my research group. Um, in general, I'm, I'm skeptical because I'm just old uh, about, <laughs> about uh, moving away from a lecture format and the personal interaction that I get with the students. Um, I, uh, I think we will, I think we will move to some mixture of these things, but right now I, I think I get more out of the human interaction, even as it takes more out of me to give that course to when you're teaching our largest chemistry course is a thousand students, and we have um, we have a tradition of one person giving that, giving the same lecture twice. But the teaching that course takes a lot out of you. Not the least is that you are more a psychological counselor than a teacher, because in any group of a thousand people there are going to be 10 people in psychological problems and they dominate your office hours. So that you have to deal with that because they are human beings, there is no way. So you wouldn't have that in an in a, in a online course. Those people would be lost somewhere else. Maybe I have helped some of them. So we got Maybe uh, we'll take these two questions, and I know we need to, to wrap up, please. I'm uh, Nick Delgas in chemical engineering. I, I'm taken with many of these ideas. What's on my mind right now is, is how we keep priming the pump, bringing the youngest people into to have a chance to see the beauty of, of what you've described. And I'm very pleased to see that there is an emphasis these days on, on learning by doing, and I, even down into the grade schools, more and more they, the, the push seems to be to do experiments and learn by, by looking at facts and trying to interpret them. Listening to you, I'm wondering how far down you can push this idea of how much you learn by explaining things to other people. 
whether in that context, I mean, I'm imagining third graders or fifth graders doing an experiment, learning something, gaining what you call understanding, and then refining that by having to explain it to peers. Do you think that would work? Yes, I think, I think it can work. Um, I think it can work. We've actually tried one time an experiment along those lines with uh, second graders. It's around the idea of, um, of symmetry operations, such as those that I was talking about for that net with fourfold axis of symmetry. Okay, so can you teach, so this is usually done in a graduate level group theory course in, in a chemistry department. So can you teach second graders about symmetry operations? Sure, uh, but it was a challenge, but it, uh, I'll cut back, get back to your point in a moment. Uh, we, what you do is you take two kids and one blindfolds the other, and they have uh, big blocks in front, some of which are triangles or squares or hexagons. And then while one kid is blindfolded, the other one does something to the triangle, let us say, that is in front of the second kid. Does something to it, whatever they want. Uh, and then the um, kids is blindfolded, takes off the blindfold and has to say, has something been done to it? And when they cannot detect that anything had been done to that triangle, like it's been rotated by 120 degrees, then a symmetry operation has been done. And uh, they get the idea. But then we went on to try to get them to explain to someone else. That was lots of fun. <laughs> they, they got caught up into the, uh, they had trouble, but some of them got it. So we were trying to, to get them to teach the idea of a symmetry operation aside from doing it, which they could learn. Uh, in fact, with this little game. Yes, so let me uh, characterize what I did uncharitably as philosophy going down this chain and, and what you've emphasized, I think, correctly is practice is important uh, in coming into science. Um, and especially important in coming into science, so uh, is also a practice or an introduction to science on the level which matches the uh, psychological makeup of the child. Um, and what I'm thinking about is, is that it's a big mistake to teach physics first, okay, because Capital, uh, it's, it's natural instead to get an introduction to science through biology because there is a natural biophilia in, in children. Uh, the collecting of bugs and plants uh, is a way into science uh, early, very early on. Then you can go on later to chemistry and physics if you want to. Um, and the mathematics can, can wait also, even though it's our prime tool for doing science. It's a good question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as a PhD student, I'm very curious of your, uh, if you could elaborate a little bit about, uh, you said halfway through your PhD, yes. you became committed. Uh, said and just, but I think there was a certain yes. element of truth to oh, that. Oh, there was, there yeah. was. So my question is this, how important is motivation uh, and effectively passion in both learning and, and teaching? Yeah, it is important and the motivation changes uh, and one's ability to evaluate what one wants to do changes. I thought I was good and not good enough for physics in college because after I had sort of decided not, not to be a pre-med because I got an A in physics but my friends got an A plus and I, I had totally confused the, uh, the, my world which, which is the world of the student continuously reinforced by examinations of, 
of how well did I do, gauged by whatever means we have. Um, you can just listen to the conversation of, of students and you can get that. I had confused uh, doing well in a physics course with doing physics, and now I know I can do physics, but at that time I didn't think I could do physics. Um, so the motivation to do the chemistry came in time, but uh, in the beginning I was just following the next thing to do that got me from being a pre-med and taking chemistry and having good research experiences to going on to graduate school in chemistry and then, but even then I wasn't sure. I was sitting in on other courses in my first two years at Harvard. And I took off a year, my second year, to go to the a not usual thing to do in 1960. I went to the Soviet Union on exchange um, at that time. And only when I came back was I, did I make a commitment. It takes time sometimes to decide, but the commitment, uh, forms the motivation, and the motivation also comes from a professor giving you some thing to do which catches your interest in some way, really, uh, completely. And that's what happened with me, with uh, Bill Lipscomb. Thank you. We, we do need to, to wrap up our session, but to thank you for joining us today. And uh, I certainly want to extend thanks to Super Dada and Mark Lundstrom for making this possible. And of course, let's give a round of applause to them, please. Okay. And just a, a, a very special thanks for Professor Roald Hoffman for, for being here today, his lecture, this discussion. I, I have no doubt this, uh, this session is going to inform our own conversation about teaching and learning going forward. And let's give him a big round of applause.